funding gap over the three-year period 2024 to 2027 and the key assumptions underpinning it. I'm conscious that a paper has been issued um, late today following the approval of the local government finance board by the Scottish Parliament yesterday. I felt it was appropriate because of the material nature of a, a couple of matters um, that the council needed to consider these matters today when setting the budget. So turning to the, hopefully all members have a copy of the, the addendum, turning to the addendum, the, the key matters I would highlight is there's an increase in the funding allocated of £2.77 million. Pounds. The bulk of this related to funding that was held back, announced at the time in, in um, December, that held back. It's now been distributed. The net effect of the release of this money has been to um, reduce the council support from the floor, and as a result, increase the funding gap, which was in my initial pace, was by £106,000. A proposal of how to close this is in the addendum and has been discussed at a meeting of the member budget working group on next time today. Also, there has been a, a reduction in capital funding of £928,000 in relation to preschool meals capital support. Um, this was included in the December figures, but has now been held back whilst discussions go on about how the funding to national level is distributed. Before I close, I'd just like to thank colleagues in CMT and ECMT for the comprehensive of me and my demands over the last six to eight months. The members' budget group and the joint budget group and trade unions for their guidance and support in getting to the position today, and particularly my own team for the significant work and support they have given me during this process. I'm happy to ask any questions, please. Thank you, thank you Mr. Puckery. Before I open this up for debate, is there any questions or points of clarification that for Mr. Puckery? Council Brooks. Thanks so much, Mr. Reza. A, a point of clarification. I, I do understand that the environment of regeneration committee makes the decisions, but budgets obviously is what this meeting is about, and my question is related to the budget that will go forward. Um, appendix 7 of the papers, page 29, that's taken over a few pages, so page 29 in appendix 7. The Kill Drive Civil Immunity site, there's a budget there for 24 25 of 234,000. Now, members will be aware that we have a temporary technological quarry site at the moment, which I understand from the Environment and Regeneration Committee that the Scottish Environment Protection Agency has a certificate that allows us to operate that. But that's temporary and it's about to run out. So, so my, my, my try to understand what 235,000 would bring us if that is the budget that we put forward. Would that allow the technological quarry to continue? Would that allow the current driving safety centre to be rebuilt? What what we buy? What we buy for two hundred and thirty five thousand in the line in um, drive seven minute mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Uh, Mr. Puckery, is that for yourself or shall I go to Mr. Jimmy? <clears throat> so you Crawford, it's okay. Um, if Stuart could answer that, but Stuart, I'm more than happy to assist with some of the figures. Thank you. Mr. Jimmison, please. Thank you, Provost. Uh, Councillor Brooks is correct to identify that there is an existing budget within the uh, papers for the uh, recycling facility in Guru. Clearly, there was a budget saving paper taken forward. And we haven't progressed the project to date, but it's officer's intention that we'll present papers to the Environment Regeneration Committee in due course, which will identify the options that are available to the Council. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay. Mr. Chris. Mr. Puckman, do you want to come back in there? Sorry, do you promise it's just to, to address the second point that Councillor Brooks asked? The 235,000 relates to the officer's estimate of the cost of bringing Kern Drive back into use as a, as a, a civic community site. Councillor McGuire. Thank you, Provost. I have two questions. I'll put them together because I think they make more sense that that's so. First question is, where will we know the true reduction of the notice that the Scottish Government gave us last night? And what are the long-term implications of us reducing the non-legislation fund to address very, very last minute? 
What's the popular place? You promised the um, local government finance order has now been finalised. I'm as confident as I can be that the figures that I've analysed will represent the position. I don't think there'll be any further changes to that. But as I've covered in my report, whenever we set the budget, there is a huge amount of uncertainty matters to be clarified. So we know the 22-23 teachers' pay award is not agreed. We know none of the pay awards for 23-24 are agreed. We don't know what's going to happen with utility prices over the next 12 months, food prices, and a whole load of other contractual matters. So the figures in front of you are my best estimates. And within that, there is an inflation contingency. The inflation contingency that we've got at the moment comes to about six, seven million pounds. And I'm suggesting that 106,000 of that is used as a pragmatic solution to close the funding gap that you've got. Obviously, we don't know what the pay award is going to be for 23, 24, but 106,000 is not going to make or break those discussions. It, it could be considerably more or less than that, depending on how those discussions go. Thank you, Mr. Parkin. Is there any other questions or clarification required? Thank you. Then I will ask Lily to speak to the, the paper. Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, it's my intention to move the recommendation contained in the report, including the proposals from the Labour the SNP and the Defend Group, which are detailed in Appendix A, but I'll invite my colleague, Councillor McGuire, to second. When we met on the 15th of December, that's been quite a while ago, uh, I said that the extent of the financial crisis facing councils was unprecedented, and I don't think I was wrong. Um, that very afternoon, the acting cabinet secretary for finance, John Swinney, had stood up in the Scottish Parliament and presented the draft Scottish budget, which included the proposed local government funding settlement for 2023-24. And I remember standing here and saying that Mr Swinney had been telling the Parliament Council we're getting an extra £570 million. Pounds in. Probably a little smile on her face to think that that happened. But I did say the devil was in the detail as always, and I think that's proved to be the case. Uh, because later that night, I was waiting patiently by my laptop for uh, Cosler to send out the budget reality document which is sent out every year. And basically, that what that showed when you stripped away the commitments for 23 24, which had already been made, new responsibilities for councils and Scottish government policy authorities. There was only extra £71 million in cash for councils. Because I like, previously lobbied the Scottish Government on the basis of a billion pounds being required for councils to stand still. Uh, so you can imagine £71 billion was quite short of a billion pounds and a huge real terms cut in our funding. Obviously, we were only prepared to accept that. So, because we have engaged them in a process of uh, lobbying the Scottish Government. Uh, making representations to both the government and other parties in the parliament, including the coalition partners in the Scottish Greens, to try and secure a significantly better settlement for local government. The all 32 council leaders came together uh, and agreed to ask for a meeting with John Swinney. Unfortunately, John refused to meet us. All 32 council leaders came together and uh, wrote a letter to the Prime Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Unfortunately, she decided she wouldn't respond to us and asked John's money to respond instead. Meetings then took place between Cosler office bearers and Mr. Swinney. He continued to assert the government's position that we were receiving £570 million pounds extra, despite the fact that both Cosler and independent commentators had said the evidence was that that wasn't the case. And there was a number of challenges to Mr. Swinney and both, uh, both Mr. Swinney and the First Minister of the Parliament. And they simply said, well, councils get more money, other services, but the NHS would need to get less money. Locally, we also made our own representations, and I'm very grateful for the cross-party basis in which those representations were made. We wrote to Mr Swinney twice. Um, we wrote to the First Minister. And again, she didn't reply to us herself. She got Mr Swinney to reply. We held briefings for our MP and our constituency in regional MSPs uh, outlining the financial challenges we were facing. I wrote, and I know others wrote to our constituency MSPs um, asking them to lobby for more money. Some of us had that peaceful lobby outside the 
Chris Stewart will have his office to try and persuade them to use his influence in the government to get us in other terms with more money. I know the blue last week, John Swinney confirmed that he was going to allocate an extra £277 million to the government. And while this is very much welcome, this funding, it's entirely ring fenced for peace. So it can't be used to reduce the cuts we're going to make today. It can't be used used to reduce the council tax increase we've got today. And despite all these months of saying there's no more money, and I did find the money from the government had to cut elsewhere, it's come up with 277 million pounds. So where did the money come from? A hundred million apparently came from points of ventures from Westminster that he was not aware of at the time in December. I'll leave that if you, if you want. But you can't explain, and it hasn't explained so far, where the other £177 million pounds come from. I don't think that's good government, to be perfectly honest. Well, as we are obviously meeting here today in the 2nd of March, and I think probably 28 other councils maybe have set their budgets already and set the council tax, so um, we are one of the, the last to do it. Uh, but up and down the country, councils are making cuts, they're increasing charges, and they're raising council tax. And they're not doing it because they want to do it, they're doing it because they're pleased to do it. They're also using reserves to keep the council tax increases down, and that, as we know, is simply not sustainable. But in Scotland, they're told us it's not sustainable, council works not sustainable. But at this point in time, we're prepared to, do, to limit the impact on our communities. Our cuts won't be the worst, I don't think, and our council tax increase won't be the highest. There's a number of councils have set the council tax increase significantly above 5.3%, the highest being 10%. The lowest council tax increase looks like being 3.9%, just to get it below 4%, so they can say it's just below 4% there. Um, we'll be around the average, but maybe slightly below the average. That doesn't give me any satisfaction, I have to say, promise, because the price of that lower council tax increase is more cuts to services for jobs. And like everybody in this room, I did come into politics to cut services and jobs in my community. I came into politics to make my community better. And to cheer you all up, it's going to get worse. That's the simple truth. <laughs> Alan's report's telling us there's an £18 million fund gap over the next three years. That's equivalent to a council tax increase of 54%. But this isn't anything new for us. I've been around these chambers for a good number of years. And I became the council leader in, in 2007 and proposed my first budget in 2008. The same year that the SNP proposed their first budget, they John Swinney was the cabinet secretary for finance in that, that uh, SNP administration. And assuming the proposals before us are agreed today, the total savings, cumulative savings, the council will have made since 2008 is £71 million. Pounds. Now that's all we're not £71 million, pounds. that's a cumulative of £71 million pounds for what was 16 years. That's an average of four and a half million pounds savings a year. And I don't know if anybody has looked at one of the first apprentices in the report, but it tells you how much to spend on a directress. So £71 million pounds is more than double what we spend on the environment regeneration resources director. And it's also more than how much we allocate in total to the health partnership. It's a huge amount of money that we've had to take out of this council over the 16 years. And just think the difference we could have made if we still had that 71 million pounds. Think of what we could do for our community. Turning back to, to council tax promise, the proposed increase 5.3% is the highest that I've moved in the 16 years I've been standing up here with the budgets. Well, I don't make that proposal lightly. Certainly, we agonise within our group for council tax, and I know various discussions went within the members' budget working group. I'm sure there was discussions in all groups about council tax because we are conscious of the impact on, on our communities. And we are in the midst of a, a cost of living crisis as well. Um, but we know, actually, that if we didn't use the million pounds of reserves, the council tax increase would be 14.4%. So that gives you a bit of perspective of the direction of travel we're going in. It's also worth reflecting for obviously over the past 16 years. For the first nine years of those 16, I stood up here and knew that there shouldn't be an increase in council tax because basically the government says there's a condition of funding, 
you have to freeze the council tax. I did the same in 2021 for the very same reason. In four of the years, we had caps in council tax, and we were limited as what we could increase council tax. And it's only been in the last two years that the government has allowed us, allowed us, us democratically elected councillors have allowed us to increase council tax without the threat of a financial penalty. But there is a penalty this year, as we know. There's a penalty if we can just get your numbers and put system. A huge penalty if we are to, to, to not deliver the government's red line. So we need to be conscious of that in the decision we make in the months ahead. But assuming the 5%, 5.3% Council tax has agreed this afternoon. I'm reasonably confident, I'm reasonably confident that I might be fast today. Um, over the past 16 years, the average council tax rise has been just over 1%. Just over 1%. So the reality is, if I actually did increase council tax by a modest amount of 3% over those years, again, we would have significantly more resources to be swapping cuts and to invest in our, our community. But the fact that we've only increased council tax by just over 1% over those 16 years is a big part of the problem we face. Because councils are now far too reliant on the Scottish Government for funding. In our case, 84% of our funding comes from the Scottish Government, just 14% from council tax and 2% from basic charges. So for every 1% that the government cuts our funding, we have to put council tax up by 6% to raise the same amount of money. And after taking account of the real terms cut in our funding to the Scottish Government, we were left with a funding gap of £13.5 million, and that's highlighted in paragraph 3.3 of the report. And to close that gap, it would require a 41% increase in council tax. Now, clearly, we were only going to increase council tax by 41%. So, we've had to, we've had to make cuts, we've had to raise charges, we've had to use reserves to, to close that gap. And as far as I'm concerned, and I know this is shared by other colleagues in the chamber, the system of local government finance in Scotland is broken. And we have a democratic deficit where councils now effectively only have control over 40% of the budgets. And that democratic deficit has actually worsened in the last few weeks, where effectively the government has taken control of local government pay negotiations, giving us even less say. I'm standing here as a council leader being called to a, a, a council meeting at Cosmo Leader Meeting tomorrow to make a decision on local government pay, and that decision effectively has been taken in St Andrew's House. They are deciding how much money they are prepared to give the council to fund pay rises to their employees, and I'm going along tomorrow and remotely to that, say, to rubber stamp the same sort of government's element. And it's just, it's not democratic. So, the government's been promising for 16 years to replace the council tax with the fair system. There have been discussions with COSLA about a new fiscal framework for local government for years. No years now, I can't remember. We're no further forward. We're no nearer to a local government finance system that's fit for this. But I know that Mr. Swinney's announced this afternoon he's, he's uh, leaving office. When the new first minister is appointed and he's going to buy benches. And I think what he's done over those 16 years in his role in government has significantly contributed to the financial crisis that councillors are facing today. This is where that normally when I stood up here over the last 16 years, I, I get the good news from us. I'm not going to get any good news today, to be perfectly honest. I really can't be bothered. I'm trying to find positives in this one here. As far as I'm concerned, the time for political spin as well. It's been interesting to observe other councils over the last few weeks when they announced their budgets making cuts, putting council tax up, putting charges up, etc. And then they got a spin. Yeah, but we didn't cut this, we didn't cut that. And they, they put a few hundred thousand in there, we put a few hundred thousand in doing that. I'm sorry, I'm not doing that. That's just spin. We're all cutting services, we're all damaging our communities, we're all putting council tax up, and it's just you no know, acceptable. So, I will, I will um, end with a, a few thanks, probably, because I, I do think the way we do things in this council is an exemplar to, to, to other uh, councils. Obviously, like you, thank God that my team and other officers and all of us have put in 
during the developments, but I think we always like the members greatly appreciate the support that we, we get from our officers. They're having to do all that day to day work as well as supporting us through the budget process. Alan obviously has been um, supporting us for a long number of years as well. Um, unfortunately, Alan is leaving us, and we are a big loss when he, when he goes. But Alan has been a fantastic support to um, all elected members and me in particular as a council leader over, over these 16 years. And his team in finance, I think, do a fantastic job as well. Our trade union colleagues, I think, work well with management and elected members. And I was at a meeting, a national meeting recently, and uh, a senior, senior um, office fellow within Unison uh, was telling us how they'd get in with Clyde as an example in terms of how trade unions and management work together. Uh, and, and I think that now to both the trade unions and the manager who want to work constructively in the best interest of this council. And the unions are engaged well with the members, and some of them will be along and support our lobby of Stuart McMillan as well. I want to thank the members of the public who respond to our consultation. I know a lot of them don't actually believe that we listen to what we say, but we generally do. And it is good to get information and feedback from elected members from members of the public. I know they won't be happy with the decisions that we're made today. They're not going to be popular decisions. Cutting services and putting council tax up. We've had to strike the balance between cuts and council tax. It'll be for us to decide if we've got the balance right, but um we have to make decisions that's what we're here for. Promise finally, I'd, I'd like to thank all my fellow elected like, members of the budget working group. Again, it's been very, very consensual and constructive. I'd like to, to thank um, all members of the council again for the constructive the, the part they have played. Uh, and I think we've been very professional in our approach. And I think we've also worked well together in our budget lobbying strategy. And I know there will be a, you know, a lot of private lobbying going on, which people will not be aware of, and for that, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful as well. I have to say, when I look at other councils, there's been a lot of chaos after the living budgets, and the council leader resigning, administrations falling, etc. Um, blame games going on. Um, you thought, ah, we've got this, etc. You want council tax up to 6%, you want it to 5%. <clears throat> We're not doing that thing even in my flight. Um, and I'm glad they're living in my flight and I'm glad I'm not involved in any of those shenanigans. We have obviously definitely failed to get 100% agreement on the, the budget this year and this share the budget working group. I have to take the blame for that. I tried my best to get consensus. But I think it's fair to say that there isn't much difference between the two proposals that I honestly would say. I did pick up a green at Telegraph yesterday and I saw a new to stop council tax hike and I opened up the page and I saw the headlines and I thought, what's happened to the, to the council? The Tories put forward a, a council tax raise and then I made six months. Ah, politics, wasn't it? So the reality of the choices which for us today come down to, do you want to make 109,000 pounds more cuts or do you want to put nine pence a week extra on the demand of council tax? There's no really a fact between this, is there? So we promise you'll be pleased to know, I've got to the point where I'm going to be following you, the recommendations in the report, including the proposals in Appendix N8 and the additional recommendations at the end of them issued this afternoon. And I will also formally move that the council, that council resolves to set the band deed council tax for Inverclyde for 2324 at £1,429.77. And I invite my colleague, Councillor McGuire, to say thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Councillor McGuire, please. Thank you, Douglas and Councillor McCabe, and I'll try to be brief. I think Steve has covered a lot of what needs to be said. I am second, seconding today the report before us with initial recommendations as indicated by my colleague here. This budget we are presenting and is before us today as a result of meeting continuously across the past nine months. As a council, we, as councillors, corporate directors, and officers, have dedicated significant time to try and find the best way forward. The reason I say best way forward is because we have been forced to make good with what we've been allocated. Across the past decade, from 2013 to 2023, we have cut four regional properties without including council tax to the amount of around £38 million. Pounds. This makes up around 17% of our 22 23 budget. Can you imagine what we could do with that money? If we haven't smoothed the effect of the cuts, that figure rises to £42 million. Pounds. That's a lot of money for an to of this size. Last year, we were promised a multi-year settlement. This is something that Scotland has continuously recommended as best practice. 
having a moment here say that the British need some stability for people in services. But alas, the Scottish Government once again has given us a one-year settlement. Not only that, but as a flat cash settlement, which adds yet another pressure to our budget. Again, we have seen significant portions of our budget being remitted, around 55% of the budget, council budget allocation. Whilst many of the Liverpool's police funds are very good at their core, by having our funds essentially controlled in this way, it means that we cannot respond or proactively build services that meet the unique needs of Inverclyde. We have significant pressures facing our council, which are not dissimilar to those faced by individuals and businesses across Inverclyde. Inflation, increased construction costs and economic turmoil just to name a few. That is why the surprise we've all had in the past 15 hours is most unwelcome. Probably 16 hours now, to be honest. We have already cut around £4 million in December. That's not even three months ago. And as I alluded to earlier today, we have been working together for nine months from what we made public last week. And I am outraged that today we found out on budget day that the Scottish Government has further cut our budget by at least 106000 I say at least because there's other capital funding that will have an impact on our budget. This is absolutely disgraceful. When looking at that figure, we were already cutting today the 950k. This has added over 11% onto the costs of cuts that we need to make. This shows a total disregard that the Scottish Government has from the government. They give us unrealistic budget statements, ring the majority of it, and then they add last minute a deduction to our grant. How are we supposed to work within these parameters going forward? We are told it's only going to get worse. We won't know the real depreciation of the grant because we don't have a multi-year settlement. We don't know what to aim towards. We have great estimates, but we don't know what's coming. Looking at the budget we've presented today, I'd like to pull out a couple of things. Firstly, the council tax is going up by 3%. We need to raise significantly more, as Councillor McCabe alluded to earlier, to avoid any cuts, even more based upon the statement, even though a few people that sound much sure to some of our constituents, it would make a world of difference. Secondly, there will be a notable change in the services we provide, even more so than before. We have stopped the sector leading the programme, something that I and other councils are part of, and many young people across the area. We have reconfigured the library service, a service which has been affected almost every year by the budget process. Our home life workers, community wardens, rounds of street staff have been reduced significantly. And the papers before us say that there will be a 38.8 full time equivalent loss. The real number and the impact of this is many more people than that. And I just want to say sorry to every employee that has needed to participate in voluntary trolls. None of this, the cuts of the trolls, is what we came into the council to do. And then finally, I need to say thank you to some people. I'm trying to make this shorter because I think Stephen's done a lot of this. So sorry if I do miss anybody. But thank you to every council around this table. Thank you to everybody in the Mayor's Budget Working Group for the trade unions and put into process. We listen to them very closely and we take guidance of them. So our chief executive, our club directors, officers, who once again have had to identify significant cuts to their directors. To members of the public who participated in the consultation and the employees that took part in the trial across a local authority. And finally, to our chief financial officer, Alan, um, thank you so much for all your input and for giving the right on the intricacies of making this budget a second motion for this. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Uh, members will see from the papers that we have an alternative budget proposal today, and I would ask Councillor Wilson if he would like to present that. Thank you, Provost. Um, I'd like to start, first of all, by commending the members of the working group under the chairmanship of Councillor McCabe. And I must say, Councillor McCabe, the very little I disagree with in your opening statement. I think I'm pretty well there in most of it apart from the setting of the percentage council tax increase. Apart from that, I'm very much in agreement. I'd like to thank the representatives of the Labour Group, of the SNP, of the Independents, and my own colleague, Graham Brooks, for taking part so enthusiastically. I'd like to thank all of the CMT, because they also have made a collective contribution. And Alan, I'm sorry to hear that you're leaving. Um, see when you go, could you leave that hat with the rabbits in it, please? Be a successor, because that saved us on a few occasions. That has. Um, my criticism here today will not be for the energy in this chamber, but I reserve my angst for the Green SNP administration in Hollywood, who put us in this situation 
you know, every year in the 16 years that I've been on this council. Um, it has meant so much work and effort to us. A budget should take six months of officers, officers and members' valuable time. It's unsettling for employees who in many cases fear for their jobs. And we do this process every year. Alan made the point that the Members Budget Working Group has met 22 times in the past year. That should not be necessary. If the Scottish Government has given us a reasonable budget to aim for, reasonable monies, and getting a proper share, that would not be necessary. When I was in the private sector, there was a golden rule. If you're marching, you're not fighting. And we're doing budget time, we're marching, we're not fighting. We're not looking after our constituents, we're not looking after those out there who need us. And it's too much marching has been going on, and that's because of the Scottish Government. We just can't concentrate on our constituents when we're having to do all this budgeting. Budget should take about a month to do it. That would be ideal. The Green SNP administration will in 2324 receive the largest ever budget from Westminster between 1,800 and 2,000 pounds per year of man, woman, and child board in English regions. More than what a family in Bristol, Norwich, or Newcastle will see. Much more money. <coughs> But we've been starved of money for a decade. There's plenty of money are there. Why has it not come to us? Two reasons. First of all, there's been a litany of failed policy by the Green SNP administration. The NHS, currently 750,000 people waiting in an appointment with a specialist. Our drug situation is the worst in Europe. That's an absolute shame because we refuse to do any rehabilitation. And we have places here like the Haven up near Kilmacroom doing a wonderful job proving that rehabilitation works. Transport, we see failures to dual the A9, a situation with island ferries, often dueling the A96 up in Inverness. Education, education, we have performance was so poor, we threw ourselves from international testing. We dropped down so much, we dropped to 24th. In, in the world, but at one stage 50 years ago, we were in the top five. So what do they do? Tests are not doing well. Let's build ourselves out from them, um, which really is, is not, not right. Justice, Peace Scotland, Ian Livingston has criticised the situation there. All these failures have cost a waste of money. Mm -hmm. Secondly, what were the pet projects that we've seen over the last decade? IFAB, Prestwick Airport. Ferries that don't sell, sell that we know very much about. The Independence Fund, putting money aside for that, that's never going to happen. 40 million recompense for false accusations against the Glasgow Rangers. What, what are we spending that money for, Councillor Property? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really should refer them to the King's Olympic Council. There's National Care Service, which is already costing money. The deposit of the turn speed, which we hear about. So there's so many things that have gone wrong that have starved us as money over these years. Our budget, which I'm proposing, at uh, Appendix 10B, 10B on pages 36 and 37, there are two main red lines we have in there. There is the charging uniformed organisations red for use of cancer premises. As a party, we're completely nothing against this. We believe that uniformed organisations give our youngsters a moral compass and a sense of discipline missing in many of our schools and in many of our homes. And I think they're very, very necessary. We have quite a lot of antisocial behaviour in Inverclyde, and I'm quite sure that youth organisations encourage them would help to decrease that. Also, the council tax, our red line, we didn't want the council tax to be any more than 5%. The administration's proposing 5.3. We're proposing 4.95 at Appendix 10B, pages 36 and 37. So hence, Mr. Provost, that is our alternative budget. And that is what we propose. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Councillor Brooks, please. Yeah, I'm happy to second Councillor Wilson. 
Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Now I'm going to open the uh, floor for uh, for debate and comment. And first of all, I would call on the leader of the opposition groups, Councillor Robertson, please. Thank you, Provost. Provost, it's been quite a year. I know today my agreement, I'll hear all this morning that none of us took the election wanting to make savings or cuts to our services. And yet, this is in our context, more so this year than the previous years. For some of our colleagues in this chamber, this is the first council budget, and it must have been quite a year for all of you. It's been a difficult year across the community, once again, with costs rising, materials of labour being difficult to find, and with tomatoes holding a commodity value that surely would make them blush in their otherwise humble previous experience. None of these issues have been caused by people on the ground. None of these have been caused by us as a council. Yet here we are, asking the people in the to accept the rise in council tax and cuts to services. We've worked through this year to build towards today's majority budget and there is an alternative budget, but I'm in this instance talking about the majority budget. Accommodating issues that have come to us unexpectedly throughout the year such as rises in our own utility bills, which have amounted to millions of pounds. Provost, so much light has been shown as we've iteratively built this budget and addressed the various elements within it on the behaviour and the choices of the Scottish Government and their part in this process, given that over 80% of our funding emanates from their grant to us. So much light has been shown on this. Light must also be shown on the decisions in Westminster that upended the economy on what seems no more than a Prime Ministerial fund late in the summer, which have impacted on where we are today. Light must also be shown on despicable levels of excess profits that have been made within the energy industry, on the broken backs of the people of this area and others, which also impact on where we are today. The very first time that I stood up in front of people to ask them to even consider me for elected politics, I quoted from the Book of Proverbs, chapter 27, which says that iron sharpens iron. And I really do believe that to be true. It's been quite a year where I've been saddened that I had to, but I've been absolutely prepared to challenge the Scottish Government for not funding local government properly. More money, less centralisation, more flexibility. I've called for all of you with partners across the chamber. Because yes, we're SNP councillors, but our concerns for our place and our sphere of government are as acute as anyone else's. I have called, I think, every year since my election for a change in the funding relationship between Scottish Government and local government. What we have is broken, but we need to have the will across this chamber, 31 other chambers, COSLA and the Scottish Government for a positive change to happen. Iron does sharpen iron, and so sometimes we have to be critical of our friends. I would ask that colleagues across the chamber also consider the importance of this when looking at the changes that could be wrought in our community. If, for example, we didn't have millions of pounds coming to Scotland immediately being used for negative mitigative purposes rather than positive investment, or if job policy could be eliminated entirely from the legislative shackles of being deemed a criminal justice issue rather than a more appropriate public health issue. It's not just the Scottish Government whose choices and behaviours should be challenged by their friends. And finally, to us ourselves promised, iron should touch something iron here too. I'm genuinely proud of how we do our budgets here. I mentioned that in a telegraph call this morning also. I know you all read it, but <laughs> mentioned that in the telegraph call also. I really do believe that we should have a consensus where possible, that we should ensure peaceful progress for Inverclyde. So as we look to next year and starting this process all over again in a few short weeks, <coughs> a challenge for sale and <coughs> for all of us to really look at things that we perhaps haven't done in our budget process well up until now. Things like looking for opportunities for funding that we can leave in ourselves. It may be a small percentage of our funding mix, but I believe we have missed out on opportunities in the past 
and it has been called loneliness, the look at this, and consider this more fully as part of our budget processes mm -hmm. in the future because it's important that we build the capacity to be able to horizon scan for our own future as much as we can. Promise I thank all the people, as has been already done many times this afternoon already, all the people who've worked hard on the calculations, the permutations, the communications. That have made both budgets, but as we talked about the majority budget this afternoon. Um, I wish that we were other than where we are, but I hope that we all have the right promise to push for change. Councillor McVeigh, please. Yeah, thank you, Provost and Robert. I associate myself with the comments of previous speakers regarding the work of officers and the trade unions to get as we are. We are today. We're off of your fantastic job and a certainly an asset in McLeod. And also to my colleagues on the Members Budget Working Group, uh, although we disagree politically, probably quite a lot of things at times uh, when it comes to the Member Budget Working Group. What, one thing is perfectly clear is that everyone around the table wants the best for Inverclyde. So thank you to colleagues on the Members Budget Working Group. But promise this is my six years of councillor, six and, and six budget. Still a novice compared to some members and maybe a wee bit more experienced than, than some of the other members. And it was very, very difficult. Uh, after December, when we took the initial £4 million pounds worth of cuts, uh, I can assure you, get into a member's budget working group meeting in a cold, wet Monday morning was not, not, uh, was not very pleasant at times because the previous week we maybe made adjustments, reduced our budget deficit. And Mr. Puckton would give us the good news that we have to uh, set some money back for utilities or whatever, and the budget cap uh, was widened again, so we had to look at taking more cuts. Very, very difficult, Thomas, and a, a very difficult budget process. But ultimately, budgets are about politics, and budgets can be political. And the SNP government budget, which has just gone through, is no different because it's about political priorities and it is clear from that budget members that local government is not a priority for the SNP government. It's about political will and again it's clear that there's no political will at Holyrood at Holyrood to uh, use the powers they already have to, use, to raise additional revenue and it's about political choices and the SNP government in Edinburgh have chosen to give Inverclyde a derisory settlement. And it is a derisory settlement, members, because why have we got a budget before us, or two budgets before us, where we have to take 6.5 6, 6 million worth of cuts to jobs and services? That's 60 full-time jobs promised, 60 salaries lost to the end of Inverclyde economy. We have to use £3 million worth of reserves, which again, we could use for better things in the current climate, and probably most difficult of all, we've got a proposal of, of a council tax rise of 4.9%, 5.3% at a time when that would cost a living crisis. Very, very difficult decisions, promised. But it didn't have to be this way, because we know that the SNP government could have listened to the STUC, and we know Councillor Daisley, a, a big fan of the STUC from the last council, and they, they put forward a proposal to raise over £3 billion pounds which could have helped local government, and they didn't. We know there were suggestions made that they could delay, the SNP government could delay the National Care Service, which is going in and use the money to support local government. Now, it's quite ironic that we hear in the press in the last day or two that that has now been delayed. So, it's not a great budget promise, but as the Councillor McCabe alluded to, as it's in the report, we did try be contacting uh, right to John Swinney and Nicholas Sturgeon. And I know, to be fair, we challenged Councillor Roberts and Councillor Curley to try and do their bit. They had a challenge with the SNP, but unfortunately, they were not successful either. Uh, and for myself, I did write to, uh, as you members will know, because I think copied everybody in on it, members will know that I wrote to Stuart McMillan uh, to try and get a better sale for this. We all did, did our bit on that. But if I can just give you one staff promise, uh, from the, the SPICE report, which is, was produced in, in February, I think that in the last 10 years, and for, uh, the Scotland's government's budget, in real terms, has increased by 8.3%. We've 
whereas Inverclyde Council revenue budget in the same period has been down by 4.2% in real terms. And every time Mr McMillan has voted for that budget, he's voted to make Inverclyde poor, Inverclyde poor. Because that's why we're here, and that's why we've got this budget in front of us. The, the terms are strong for Scotland, they certainly are strong for Inverclyde. With that own record on it. Absolutely not. But promised ultimately, we've got two budget proposals before us today, which I don't think we really like. I don't <coughs> really want to put them through because what's contained in them, but we'll have to. And for the record, I will be supporting uh, the budget in Appendix 10A, not 10B. But I think the most important document in the report is Appendix 11, when we're looking at £18 million budget gap over the next 10 years. I'll be telling you as a councillor, 10 years of talking about cuts, 10 years of underfunded budgets and ring fencing, 10 years of fighting to try and save what I have in my community in Ward 7 and across the plate as a whole. Something has to change, members. The Scottish Government must step up to the plate and support local government. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McVeigh. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Law and then Councillor McCloskey. Thank you, Provost. Um, the budget process has been challenging, to say the least. I'm sure I'm not the only one here who's had sleepless nights over it, the decisions we've had to, been forced to take. Following representation from the public, I have particular concerns around the removal of family support workers from the most deprived areas in Inverclyde. These workers have went above and beyond for the communities they've served, offering support for postnatal depression, providing food parcels to hungry families, giving them valued access to book bug sessions and cooking on a budget classes, to name just a few things. It's vitally important that these families continue to receive the support they, they need. So can we please have assurances from the corporate director that targeted support will be offered to the families in these centres affected who will face hardship as a consequence of the removal of the family support worker. Thank you, Councillor Law. Councillor McCluskey, please. Thank you, Provost. Um, when I was standing for election, like I think a lot of us who were new to this last year, um, I had a lot of conversations with people on the doorstep where we said that the times ahead were going to be tough. Um, but I don't think any of us were really prepared for quite how tough these decisions would be. And, for all of us in any party who are newly elected this year, um, this is far from where we want to be because as Councillor McCabe himself has said earlier, not always come in to politics to make these kind of decisions, and especially when it's largely out of the control of any of us in this chamber today. But while this might be difficult, I think at the outset it's just important to remember um, that you know other people in our area are having to make very difficult choices every day. Well, these choices that you're making today are difficult. Um, other people in our community are having to make incredibly challenging decisions at this point in time because of the economic crisis, the cost of living crisis and rampant inflation. People have to make the choice between eating their homes and feeding their families. People facing impossible financial choices because they've lost their jobs, such as at Amazon and my board or workers considering whether to lose pay through strike action because they're being asked to take more pay cuts next year. These choices are all more difficult than the choices we make today, but the choices we're making in this chamber are going to affect all of those people because we know that when local council budgets are cut and when they fall, it's too often those kinds of people that I've just spoken about who rely most on the crucial services um, we provide and who will look to us for support. Um, I take on board what the Councillor McCabe said about how challenging this budget is, um, but I think the member budget working group has gone some way to protect frontline services that a lot of those groups and some of those vulnerable in our community will rely on, and largely through the you know ingenuity and skill of a lot of the workforce and applied council, there's going to still be a lot of good done in our community, whether that's in our schools, through our health and social care services, or in our community services across Inverclyde. And you know, the lowest income people in this community won't, you know, who are on council tax discounts or exemption won't um, be seeing any rise in council tax. And 
some of the vital local services that you know, were discussed for cuts at the start of this um, process, um, we have been able to, to save. But I don't really see that as something um, to be celebrated because these choices, they're only possible by taking money from other places, by asking people to pay more. Um, and it's very much robbing Peter to pay Paul. And choices like that year on year will just become more and more uh, unsustainable the further that we get through this council. And as I said at the outset, most of the reasons for why we're making these decisions, they are out of our control. Because at the root of the choices made by two governments who are making our lives and the lives of our constituents no better. And I have to associate myself with some of the comments that uh, the council that they just made, you know, first we've got a Scottish government that's made a choice to pass on cuts to local government that are even greater um, than what they have experienced. Um, the Scottish Parliament Information Centre has shown that the revenue budget the Scottish government has gone up 8.3% since 2013, but they've only uplifted Sco uh, Scottish council budgets by 4.3%. And if local government is to survive, and I think that's what we're talking about, we're not talking about um, you know, thriving, we're talking about surviving here, we're going to need more generous settlements, we're going to need a new um, way of doing business with the Scottish Government that really reflects the importance of the services that we provide. And that also means long-term certainty about budgets, as Council McGuire has already <laughs> mentioned. It means multi-year budgets so that we aren't in this constant interminable discussion about what to cut and when. And I don't know if I should take it as a glimmer of hope that watching the SNP leadership hosting, as I watched all hour and a half of it last night, because that's what I do if I need things. Um, some of the uh, candidates for First Minister um, seem to be open, not all, but some seem to be open to having a new settlement for local government. And I think, in addition to the lobbying that I know members of the set have undertaken over the last uh, period of time, I was hoping that maybe some pressure is brought to bear on all three of the candidates for First Minister to really ensure that they hear the voice of the SNP councillors in this process. Um, and in that vein, you know, I, I applaud what Councillor Robertson um, has done in the way that she has constructively engaged with this budget process. And I think, having been in a similar position myself in the past, I know it takes quite a lot of bravery to, um, to say we disagree with your own party. Um, I think that has to be recognised. And it's, it's to her credit that we've got a budget proposal in front of us today that can be supported by the SNP, by Labour and by the independent councillors. But I have to say that not just Councillor Robertson, but all of the SNP councillors have really been left high and dry by their parliamentary colleagues, um, who once again have doubled down on cuts to local government, by our SNP MSP, who um, hid in his office when councillors and trade unionists went to lobby him last Monday, and then the following day on Tuesday voted for a budget that cut and replaced funding. But at least Mr McMillan made his position known, whereas our Member of Parliament, on the other hand, could find time to criticise this Council's hard-working refuse collection workers in the pages of the Green Telegraph. Apparently the dump isn't clean enough, um, but couldn't break his silence over the cuts to local government funding. Yeah, yeah. And then, you're not getting off. It's not great. <laughs> Just turning to the Conservatives and their amendment today, I have to say, Councillor, we'll say Councillor Bruce, it's nothing more than grandstanding. Um, for nearly half the households in Inverclyde, what you're proposing as a, as a saving amounts to six pence a week for nearly half the households in Inverclyde. What do you get for six pence a week? We're asking people who rely on holiday schemes over the summer to pay even more, and we're asking you know, people in Europe to see their local <laughs> closed all for six pence, and at a time when thousands of households in our area are subject to a penalty now on their mortgages because of higher interest rates caused by a botched budget last year. So I would say a, a brass neck would be a polite way to present a 4.95% <laughs> increase in a 6p saving a week as, as, lo as low as low tax and uh, to convince them that they're better off with conservative policies. Um, and I would politely ask that perhaps you might consider withdrawing your amendment to the budget today. Um, so to close, promise, it's with regret that I'll support a budget today that asks people to pay more when we are reducing services, but I'm confident that this is the best budget to respond to the unprecedented situation we and every other council across Scotland find themselves in. It avoids compulsory redundancies, it protects 
many frontline services and at a time when inflation is running at double digits, I ask people to make a far smaller additional contribution to council tax. And finally, as others have done, I thank the leader of the council, councillors from all the political groups involved in the budget working group, um, our council officers who've worked together for the hard work to raise this budget today, and to the trade unions who have worked so constructively um, alongside us through this whole process. And so I would urge members to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCluskey. Uh, previous Councillor Law was uh, addressing the meeting. And she did ask a question of the Director of Education. It was remiss of me not to bring the Director of Education in. Uh, Ms. Biggs, please. Good afternoon, everyone. And yes, to, to provide some response to that. And it is heartening and it's good news to, to hear the, the good work our earlier centres right across the board are doing. And to be very clear, with less resource in the system, we are not going to be able to replicate and duplicate what we previously have done. However, that, um, that high quality support has been built upon by high quality relationships across the, all of our family centres and early years centres. And, uh, and, and what I would say is we will continue to provide for support and targeted support for families who do need that in a variety of different ways. And we will look to see where there are other po uh, possibilities within the system, within partnerships with the third sector, our own support centres, and also with our colleagues in HSCP to make sure that the families are targeted and uh, do receive the appropriate support. Thank you, Ms. Biggs. <clears throat> Councillor Faulkner, please, and then Councillor Jackson. Yeah, thank you, Provis. Uh, you'll be glad to know and I'll be long. Uh, there's just a couple of things on, on the debate that's happened so far that I would possibly like to, to comment about. Um, firstly, sometimes when you've been here for so long, you remember things, and uh, I'm sure Councillor McCabe will remember a former First Minister proclaiming a new concordat with local government. Unfortunately, the local government concord that didn't last that long. Um, and what we've seen in Councillor Cave's remarks is what we're faced with is that democratic deficit in local government. And it is with any centre government's um, wish to centralise power. And this government is no different from any other. And I include previous Labour um, governments as well. Um, but there is an issue here that what we're actually seeing is we're seeing that drift away from what government control. And that is a big issue that we should all be worried about. We've seen that I've commented before on uh, the health board and the lack of democratic control over the health board. And um, to a lesser extent, I've commented on it with the IJB, but I was also worried about when we were stepping forward to, to the new National Care Center. <laughs> like, we know the John Swinney when he's eyes is actually threatened to take education away from, from local government as well. Um, so there is that we to say, well, local government is a very important tier of government in general, and we've got to, to make sure um, it's looked after, and that's for all the parties. Uh, I've got to admit, from, from the comments we will, um, that's been on the table, there is always a, a gut wrench Whenever I hear Councillor Robson talking about marching, I always think, <laughs> where is it going next? <laughs> um, it, but in, in all honesty, you know, from a party that thanks the UK economy, you've not really got many legs to stand on to tell you the truth. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about new councillors here, you know, it's, we've seen a involved with the prime ministers in the country, and, and we're in such dire economic straits nationally that, in all honesty, the SNP are quite right to, to look at the UK government. Um, we as a Labour group are quite right to look at the SNP government in Holyrood. It doesn't do as much good when we're down here in Inverclyde and try to do the best for the people in Inverclyde. Uh, turning to, to Councillor Robertson, uh, I did a wee chuckle in my throat when she was talking about tomatoes as commodities, and I just thought, obviously she's not tried turnips. <laughs> she's always been not tried. So, but you're bloody maybe. Try to not just in vodka. I know you don't drink. Try to not just in vodka as well. Um, it, it's great to be lovely. I've, I've heard it by a cabinet when minister um, swears by it. Uh, but we are in a situation where we are making these cuts. And the only reason we're not making as many cuts is because we're using three million pounds worth of reserves. 
And that is a stark reality to us all around this table. So the members of the budget working group are going to be back around that budget working group with the same savings that we've rejected this year. We're going to be in the exact same position again next year. And I think that's the reality for us all around this table. You know, whereas as councillors, we brought in that policy to try and let older people on council go to be replaced by your people. When you think that was a, a genuine policy that we were wanting to do to try and get new blood into the council and to tr try and refresh our workforce, all that's out the window now. Because what we're doing is making the people redundant. Um, fortunately enough, just now it has been on a voluntary basis. But we know ourselves that it's not the person you make redundant. It's the actual job itself. And that job will never be filled. And that means that position is no longer there for someone in the place to move into it. So it's sad. It's going to get sad. So similar to all you know, the work that people have done, I know we the budget work with myself, how painstaking it is. So just thank you all for that. And, and obviously, uh, it pains us to say we are going for a cut budget. And it, it's a pity. In, in some ways, it's not a pity because at least we can say it's, it's it's a majority budget, we're including the ponies, and that might be a bit, a wee bit better for us to, to go with this, uh, with, but it is a cuts budget, and unfortunately that's what <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Okay. Councillor Jackson, please, and then Councillor Carly. Thank you, Provost. Uh, Provost, I did come here to give a speech or any notes. I just, in fact, I came in here undecided what I was going to do today, but I've been listening to other members. And like Councillor Law, I've got a, a lot of sleepless nights over this. I've heard members use words unprecedented, unsustainable, democratic deficit. We come in today and there's another £106 million cut. Uh, loss of control, spin, you know, loss of local uh, democracy. Uh, Councillor McCabe, in his experience, has told us that. In the last 16 years, we've had £71 million pounds worth of cuts. Uh, we had £13 million pound cuts to address this year. And we have an £18 million pound funding awaiting us. So I suppose the question I'm asking myself is how long can we go on? And we've heard the, the saying, enough is enough. And I think for myself, enough is enough. And I won't support either of the budgets today. And I don't see that. I don't take a decision lightly because I've got a lot of respect for everybody here today, Mr. Popley and everybody within the Members' Budget Work Group. Uh, I can't say enough how, how highly respected you are, but I, I, I can't reflect these cuts here. I've got on everybody in here to see how none of us come in here uh, to make cuts over 40 days stood last year, both the communities who are going to stand up for in the first time of day is cut their services for jobs. So. Thanks, Provost. That's all for us. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Carby, please. Yeah. Thank you, Provost. And I can, um, thank you, everybody's contributions there. I think, it's, I think it's how we do politics down here. And it's good to see that at this stage in the budget, at least we're all still in the chamber. I think I never played the SP group has worked with other groups within the ch this chamber to support people that have been But we have to admit, the have, we have reduced the, the actual the, the constraints that have been imposed on us. And um, we, we have differences about where, we sh where, the, where, this, where the real issues lie here. And I take it as it's been leveled in the Scottish Government. We are listening to that. And we, we obviously, when you call it, want to be in a position where we have an improved relationship with the local government. That has to be said. But then I look at what's actually, what's driving this, what's driving these cuts. And I really have to think it's a difference of philosophy. Now, that's, if you mentioned, talk about the Green Telegraph, which I wrote in the night on the Green Telegraph about, I didn't think there was a difference of philosophy. I think nobody in the thing wants to see cuts. But then I suppose when looking at the Conservative group today, and I think Councillor Wilson said we had a target of 4.95%. So that's it. I've heard 4.95%. Let's get this. And as other members of have said, political grandstanding. The target 4.95%, what do we do to get there? As opposed to saying, well, what services do we need? 
So I think other members of the group said, well, what services do we have? Like, what can, what's the least first option? Balancing tax, tax rises against spending cuts. And we came up with a value, and it did fluctuate. I remember it went down and up and went down. You know, as down some of my VSS, you, you get cuts, you think you get somewhere. And with the bucket, we come in and say that, oh, unfortunately, if I do review, it's now another £2 million because of, of our, 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 what do you call it, our uh, energy bank bills, etc. But so I go back to that point of philosophy. So therefore, we've got an issue of philosophy. Therefore, I think there is a difference in philosophy. You look at what public services you need and plan accordingly, or do you decide, let's have to go for low public taxation and then see what we can provide with that. And I think, to be fair to conservatives, that's a difference in philosophy. 4.95%, let's get on to 5%, what can we cut with that? And just imagine that on a national scale. And then you'll see the problems that face all governments in the UK. And, and local government in, in England, local government in Wales, and devolved administration in Wales and in Northern Ireland. And you see what we have to do. And this doesn't just affect the global expenditure. If you look at the Social Security expenditure, Social Security is, is what you call, and these kinds of prices is very important. You need to have that very good, very open safety net. But next year, Scottish Government is planning to spend £776 million mitigating the Social Security system in Scotland. Now that is money that can be spent elsewhere. It is a political choice, and it does put pressure on other aspects of government spending in Scotland, and it does put pressure on local government spending. But that is a choice the Scottish Government made. That's the choice as SMP member we have to take on board. But I think a challenge to my Conservative Communist friends across the day where, is that's a challenge you have to make as well. My colleague, Elizabeth Robertson, said, friends need to really call it challenge friends. We've been taking that from this chamber to challenge our friends in government to see if we get to improving the Scottish government settlement. Really. You need to do the same. Don't just say Scottish government is fine. And if Tate also takes on the various issue about council tax, sorry, about other tax rates and powers, yes, we do need to do that. I just, in a chamber, before we arrive this chamber, I'm saying we should really make the case for such 30 offers, we should be getting more taxation powers. Not just the ones that Council of the suggests, but other ones. What can we do in Scotland to make a difference? So I would challenge everybody, which, but more importantly, I would challenge my Conservative Unionist friends to make sure that you challenge the UK government and challenge whatever Prime Minister is in power to do the job properly. Fund Social Security, fund local government in England, which has an impact on both local government friends in Scotland, and do their job properly. And then we may have a good chance to do ours. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pam. Is there any other member? wishing to make a contribution at this time. Then I will return to Councillor McCabe to, to sum up. I'll be, sorry, I'll be very brief. <coughs> I think we've had a good debate here, a constructive debate, calm debate uh, uh, as well. I think the only, the, the only substance I suppose I want to address is the Conservative alternative. Uh, and Councillor also mentioned specific issues which was the council tax rise and the uniform organisation. The simple matter is that if Councillor Brooks hadn't indicated on behalf of the Conservative groups that they couldn't support a council tax rise of uh, 5%, uh, we would have not taken savings in the uniform organisations. That's the simple reality of it. We were, we were trying to seek we were trying to seek uniform agreement. Or on that, on all savings, and simply because Councillor Brooks decided that he couldn't support a council tax rise of 5.3%, that the remaining groups didn't decide to take that particular savings. And I don't know why group uh, originally would have been that savings in December uh, would draw and to take that savings. But if you had agreed with a, with a, a slightly higher council tax, and it's very, very marginal, I would say, 
and conservative groups up and down the country have been supporting council tax riders higher than 5.3 percent. We wouldn't have that much like I say that uh, so I would I would wish you to reflect on that for, for future years. Um but I, I, as I said, I, I think we've had a good discussion and a good debate. We're obviously the, uh, discussing national politics issues as well. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, we, we are all with a, a heavy heart um, supporting what our motion we support because we know that this will have an impact in our, our community and we know that there are help behind the head. But I have to say to my colleague, Councillor Jackson, that, yeah, Let's sit on your hands and and, 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 and no hope for either either motion. But that's full in the knowledge that one of the motions is going to get through. And that's the simple reality. And and, and how do you avoid the cuts? How do we how do, how do we avoid the cuts in, in terms of uh, the cuts we're making today, the cuts that we made in December and cuts that we've made previously? How could we avoid those cuts? We can avoid it by putting council tax on. By a far significant more, more, more of it, I would be prepared to support. I have to say, to achieve consensus, uh, we've we've had to strike a balance. I don't, I don't re recall in one single occasion, Councillor Jackson arguing to me or within my group that we shouldn't be making cuts and we should be put council tax up to avoid making those cuts. I simply don't recall that happening. Um, so, um, yeah, sitting your hands and abstain today, but to me. I'm sorry, that's the council's way out. Thank you, Councillor McKay. We have a, a motion for a, a budget and we have an alternative for budget proposal. Uh, Mr. Strachan, please. Thank you, Boris. Uh, yes, so we have a motion from Councillor McKay, seconded by Councillor McGuire, the amendment from Councillor Holmes, mm. seconded by Councillor Boots. So, Councillors, can I ask you to indicate your vote for the motion, amendment, or not voting? Councillor Brennan. Motion. Councillor Boot. Amendment. Councillor Cassidy. Motion. Councillor Clockerty. Motion. Councillor Crowder. Motion. Councillor Curley. Motion. Councillor Daisley. Motion. Councillor Jackson. Abstain. Councillor Law. Motion. Councillor McKay. Motion. Councillor McCluskey. Motion. Councillor McCormick. Motion. Councillor McGuire. Motion. Robert McKenzie. Motion. Councillor McVeigh. Motion. Councillor Moran. Motion. Councillor Nelson. No, motion. Councillor Quinn. Motion. Councillor Reynolds. Motion. Councillor Robertson. Motion. And Councillor Wilson. Amendment. So the uh, motion is passed, 18 votes, two of one abstention. Thank you, Mr. Strachan. And thank you, members, for uh, a very fine debate. Uh, item three in the agenda is evaluation of movable heritage assets. Uh, Mr. Puckin, please. Thank you, Provost. Um, this report is seeking approval from the Council as trustee for the Watt Trust to contribute up to £20,000 in the unallocated Watt Trust balances the fund evaluation of the trust assets as required in 21.2 for detection plan and have to answer any questions. Thank you. Is there any questions for Mr. Puckin? Can we agree the recommendation? Really? Indeed. Thank you, members. Uh, that brings the meeting to our close. I thank you for your attendance here this evening with your safe journey. Thank you, members.